Hi there, this is Matt Heffernan. Welcome back to my channel. This is the sixth episode in a series that seeks to demystify programming and assembly language for the 6502 family of 8-bit processors. We're using the Commander X16 as a target as it has a 65CO2 and is a particularly excellent platform for this learning process. If you haven't seen the previous episodes and need to start at the very beginning, please go back to my channel. Don't forget to subscribe and click the bell for notifications while you're there so you know when the next episode comes out and start this playlist from the beginning. So far in this series, we have introduced the basic concepts of assembly programming, learned how to access memory in different ways through addressing modes, how to implement flow control with branching and subroutines, basic arithmetic and logic, and how the stack works. Now we are going to go back a bit to branching, this time using some of the advanced methods for bit testing and manipulation that are available for the 65CO2. In fact, most of what we will see in this lesson was not available for earlier processors in the 6502 family, but all can be used with the X16. The instructions we used before for setting status bits and branching dealt with values holistically, even if it ultimately came down to the resulting sign bit. The new instructions we will cover now all deal with each bit individually, and either do the branching themselves or depend on only the Z bit for status. Let's jump right into a case study that we are going to use for the rest of this lesson and go through an evolution while learning how to use some of these instructions. First we will take a look at the only legacy 6502 instruction that deals with bits individually, which is appropriately enough called bit. To show how it works we have a simple program that will take an input from the keyboard and tell you whether the first character type has an even Petsky code or not. First we need to define the address of the carein subroutine in the kernel, which will activate the cursor and return after the user has hit the return or enter key. It will place the first character code entered in the accumulator, and successive calls will get the remainder of the characters entered up to and including return. But here we're just going to call it once to get that first character, then determine whether it is odd or even. With the original 6502 there were two methods for doing this. The one we learned about in our lesson on logic was the AND instruction, which we can use to mask out everything but that low bit, resulting in the Z bit getting set if the low bit is zero, and therefore the code entered was even. If the Z bit is clear, that means that the low bit of the code is set and the code was odd, meaning that we will fall through the following BEQ instruction and print an N character to the screen and then return. If the code was even, we branch on the BEQ and print out a Y instead. While this method works perfectly well in this case, the AND instruction does require you to modify the contents of the accumulator just to set the Z bit. Alternatively, we could use the bit instruction with the same operand, and the accumulator won't be changed, but the Z status will be the same as if we had done the AND instruction. Let's take a closer look at the bit instruction, which officially stands for Test Bits in Memory. For the immediate mode, as we saw earlier, it tests the bits in the accumulator, setting the Z bit if the result of a bitwise AND between the value in the accumulator and the operand is zero. For the 65CO2, that's all it does, but for earlier processors it may have other effects, like we will see for the other modes. Bit can also be used with the absolute and zero page modes, in which cases the operand is the address of a memory value that is under test, and the accumulator needs to be preloaded with a bit mask. However, if you're only testing one of the upper two bits at that memory location, you don't even need to preload A, as the N bit will always contain the state of the memory values bit 7, and the V bit will always contain the state of bit 6. This behavior is very useful for memory mapped hardware, which is why platforms like the Atari 2600 tend to have the most commonly monitored bits in the 7 and 6 spots. Only the Z bit depends on the mask in A, which works effectively the same as the immediate mode. Of course, the accumulator is not affected regardless of mode, and neither is the C bit, so only the branch instructions for the other three status bits are of use after a bit instruction. Let's go back to our case study and change it up a bit. Let's declare a RAM variable for the first character returned by care in and call it input. Now we no longer need to worry about it being preserved in the accumulator by simply storing there immediately. Now we can load A with the bit mask and test input one of two ways. If we use the bit instruction, the value in input won't be changed. We will simply test that low bit and continue on to the BEQ as before. Now that we are using the absolute mode, 
The N and V bits are also getting set with bits 6 and 7, respectively, of the value and input, but we don't really care about that in this case. If we did want to change the contents of input to force it to be even while testing the original value, we could instead use the TRB, or Test and Reset Bit instruction. This will clear that low bit in input as that bit was set in A. In fact, any bit set in A would be cleared in input by a TRB, but the Z bit will be set the same as if you had used a bit instruction. So the remainder of the program will output the same regardless of which instruction you use, and the user will see whether that first character they entered has an even Petsky code. But now we have a code stored in RAM that will be the original value if it was even, or the code one less than that if it was odd. TRB was added to the instruction set for 65CO2, and only supports the absolute and zero page modes. It does not affect the accumulator, only the Z bit, and the value at the address in the operand. It effectively does three logic operations. Like bit, it sets the Z bit as if you did an AND instruction, but the direct result of the AND is not stored anywhere. It then effectively does another AND between the memory value and the inverse of the A value, storing the result back at the operand address. To do all this and preserve the A value and get the desired Z bit state at the end would take quite a few instructions with the original 6502. Unlike bit, TRB will not change the N or V bits. Also added for the 65CO2 was TSB, or Test and Set Bit. It works the same as TRB, except that it does an effective OR between the memory value and A, and stores that at the operand address. This means that whatever bits are set in A will also be set at that location in memory. Of course, it still does an AND to determine the Z bit state, but does not change the accumulator or any of the other status bits. This would also take quite a few instructions to accomplish with the original 6502. Let's go back again to our case study, except this time we are going to move input to the zero page rather than main RAM. Otherwise, using bit in the code is still the same, just with the zero page modes instead of the absolute modes. We load the bit mask into A, do the bit, and then BQ to branch on the Z bit. But if we are only testing one bit on the zero page, we could consolidate all three of those instructions into a single new one called BBR, or Branch on Bit Reset. Specifically, we use a BBR0 instruction, with input and the at even label as operands. So this is a bit different, an instruction mnemonic with four characters including a number, then a pair of operands with a zero page address for testing, and a relative address for its branch target. That number in the mnemonic indicates which bit in the zero page value we are testing, in this case bit zero. Using those three legacy instructions will take up six bytes of program memory, and take between seven and nine cycles to execute, depending on whether the branch was taken, and whether that relative address would result in a branch to a different page of memory. Substituting the BBR brings that down to only three bytes of memory, and a fixed five cycles regardless of outcome. So the BBR instructions were added for the 65CO2, and there are eight different opcodes, one for each bit that can be tested. They all use both the zero page and relative modes, creating a weird sort of hybrid mode combining the two. So the assembly instruction starts with the bit-specific mnemonic, followed by a pair of comma-separated operands. The zero page address to test first, then the relative address to branch to if the specified bit is clear. Just like the legacy branch instructions, the relative address must be between minus 128 and plus 127 of the address following the instruction. The accumulator and status bits are completely unused and unaffected by these instructions, and there is no change to memory, only the program counter is affected, moving on either to the next instruction or to the relative target address. Of course, there is a complement to BBR that tests for bits being set. It's called BBS, or branch on bit set not bulletin board service. If the latter term came to mind first, congratulations, you are the target demographic for my channel. Like BBR, there are eight different BBS opcodes, one for each bit, and will branch to a relative address if the specified bit is set in the specified zero page location. All BBS instructions take only five cycles as well, regardless of outcome, and no memory, accumulator, or status bits are affected. Let's go back to our case study one more time. We're going to stick with using bit to test for an even code and BEQ for the branch. 
but we also want to make the value and input even, like we did with the TRB instruction a couple iterations ago, but this time a little faster. With the legacy 6502 instruction set, we'd have to store the code and input, and then push the original value to the stack. Then, do an AND with hex FE to clear bit 0, and store the new value and input. Finally, we pull the original value back off the stack and proceed to the bit test. Instead of all that, on the 65C02, we can just call the RMB0 instruction with input as its operand, and the original value in A will still be there, so we can go right to the bit. This time, we have replaced 6 bytes of code and 13 cycles of execution with only 2 bytes of code and 5 cycles. RMB stands for Reset Memory Bit, and it does just that. It clears any bit in the zero page with a single instruction, without affecting any registers or status bits. There are eight different opcodes for RMB, just like BBS and BBR, with one for each bit and all using the zero page mode. The number in the mnemonic will be the bit number that is cleared at the address in the operand, and that's all that will happen. Everything else stays the same, and execution will continue with the next instruction, a scant two bytes and five cycles after the start of the RMB instruction. There is no corresponding instruction for an absolute address, only the zero page has this capability, which is useful for any program status you'd like to define, and a good reason to keep flags like this stored in the zero page. Of course, there is a corresponding set of instructions for setting a bit in the zero page, namely SMB or set memory bit. Just like RMB, it has an opcode for each of the eight bits and takes a zero page address as an operand. Between SMB and RMB, the zero page becomes an even more precious resource, as its use can really speed up and compress programs at the same time, so use it wisely. Remember, you only have 94 bytes on the X16 zero page to use however you want, and others that can be used with caution. With all of these new instructions at our disposal, let's write a new example program. We're going to need to get some data on the zero page, where we can muck around a bit with it. Rather than using fixed data, however, we'll let the user input the data with the keyboard. That means we'll need a bunch of constants for dealing with the zero page, the kernel, and Petsky codes. So let's start by defining classes of constants that we can separate with comments. First we define the zero page address we will be using, which is the unused byte at hex 30. Then we define the kernel subroutine addresses we need, which now includes care in as well as care out. We saw a bit of how Karen worked in our case study, and now we'll see it in action. After that, we need to define a bunch of Petsky control codes for new line, space, and different character colors that we'll be using. Then just a regular program constant that defines the maximum number of characters we are going to read with Karen, in this case 40. Then after the jump start instruction, we define our main RAM variables, starting with a buffer to store the input characters. That buffer is defined using the .res control command, which sets aside a number of bytes in memory all with the same value. With no value specified as a second argument, the default initial value will be used, which is 0, unless you are using a non-standard configuration for CA65. Then we have one more variable, a single byte labeled size, that we can use to store the size of the input string after we come to the end of the Karen input, or the first 40 characters, whatever comes first. At the start of the program, we initialize the X register to zero and make our first call to care in. If it's not the newline character, indicating that the user hit return immediately after the prompt appeared, we fall through the BEQ and store the code that was loaded into A to input, indexed with X. Then we increment X and compare that against our maximum input size. Then we keep going through the loop until we hit that new line or X is incremented all the way to 40 and we finally end up falling to the at done label. There we store the current value of x to the size variable, then print out a new line to make sure our program output will go directly below what the user just typed. Now we want to print that string back out, but this time with the characters color coded based on their bit values. So we initialize x again to be 0, then load a character from input and store it to code on the 0 page. Then we do a bit on code to set n to bit 7 of the code, so that if the bit is set, which means that it's probably a graphical character, we branch to at gray. If bit 7 is clear, we continue to the BBS6 instruction, which will branch to green if bit 6 is set. 
indicating that the character is probably a letter. Of course, we could have just done a BVS here, as we already did the bit, and the V bit should still be set accordingly, but this is just an example, right? Anyway, if bit 6 is clear, we load A with the Petsky control code to make the text light red, then branch to at print code. If we branched earlier to at green, we load the light green code, then branch to at print code. If we branched earlier to at gray, then we load the light gray code and continue on to at print code. There we finally output the color control code in A, then load the character back from the zero page, which is faster than indexing into the string again, and print it out in whatever color was determined. Then we increment X and see if we have printed out all the characters yet by comparing it to size. If we're not at size yet, we branch back to print to get the next character in the string and go through the loop again until we finally get through the end. Once we do, we will fall through the BMI and print out a new line to move the cursor to the next line. Now we are going to examine the first character that was entered by printing it out again with its hex code. First we go back to the white text, then load that first character by just doing an absolute load from input without any indexing. Then we store that back into code on the zero page. But while it's still in the accumulator, we call our old friend print hex to print out the hex code of the character. Then we print out a space followed by the character itself so we can see the Petsky hex code and character glyph side by side. Then we print a new line before our next experiment. We can check to see if this character might be graphical by loading hex 80 into A then doing a TSB on code. This will test bit 7 in code and then set it if it wasn't set already. If it was not set already the BEQ will branch to at red. If bit 7 was already set, we will continue to load the light gray code into A and branch to at print mod. If we branched to at red, we load the light red code into A and then continue on to at print mod, where the determined color code will be output. Then we load the now possibly modified character code into A and call print hex, which will either print an unmodified code in light gray or a modified code in light red, right under the original code. Then we print out a space, and finally the character code itself, which will definitely be a graphical character now, in the same color as the hex code to its left. Next we print out another new line, followed by the light green code. Then we do an RMB7 on code, which will now clear bit 7, reverting either to its original value or to whatever the non-graphical character is that shares bits 0 through 6 with the original. We print out its Petsky hex code, a space, and the character itself, so again we see a code and glyph pair, this time in green. Before we return back to basic, we output the white character code to make sure the user isn't typing in green when they move on to their next task. That almost seems like a practical program, doesn't it? It may not have been programmed in the most efficient way, but it does show how a lot of these new instructions work. Anyway, let's move on to our text editor. Okay, here's the code with the same old segment preamble and the constants spaced out a little to make the different classes easier to pick out. And then we have the code we saw in the slides and finally the print hex code that we've used for the last couple episodes. Of course all of this code and all the slides from this series are available on the GitHub repo linked in the description below. Also there you will find the build script. Here you see we are going to build bits.asm into bits.prg, which we can test in the emulator. So let's get this program built and try it out. Okay, so let's run the build script. And now we can see that bits.prg is there. Now we'll run the emulator. And we'll maximize it to get a better look at what we're doing. Now we can load bits.prg and run it. And now we just have a blinking cursor. That means we must be in that initial care in call. So let's type out the best string we can think of. After hitting enter, or return if you have one of those fancy x16 keyboards already, we'll see how the program processes our string. As you can see, the letters came out as green, as expected, and the special characters were red meaning that bits 7 and 6 are both clear for them, as we would expect for most characters that aren't letters or graphical characters. Then we see how that first character, the letter H, is further processed. 
we see that the Petsky code for H is hex 48, same as the capital H in ASCII or Unicode. Being a letter, bit 7 is not set, so the next line shows the character with bit 7 set, changing the hex code to C8 and the glyph to a slightly offset vertical line. Both in red indicate that they were changed. Then we see it revert back to an H on the last line in green, and our program returned. Let's run it one more time. But this time we're going to hold down that shift key while typing the initial H in hello. And the W in world for good measure. Now we can see that we have graphical characters in place of the H and W, and they are color-coded gray on the first output line as expected while the unshifted letters are still green and the special characters are red. We also see that the shifted H gives us that same vertical line we saw earlier, which is not a coincidence. Shifting any of the letters will effectively set bit 7 in the code that is put into the keyboard buffer. So now we can see that the program simply repeats that same code in glyph, this time in gray, as it hasn't changed yet. Then it goes back to a familiar H when the program finally clears bit 7 and prints the result in green. When you try running this code yourself, try some numerical characters and see how they behave. Better yet, hack the code and try different criteria for setting different colors. If you want a good reference for Petsky codes, including all the control codes and the alternative upper lower character set, uh, check out the link at the bottom of the repo's readme. So that's it for this lesson. We are almost through the entire 6.5 CO2 instruction set, but we have a lot more to cover, so please subscribe to my channel and click on the bell to get notified when the next video comes out. Better yet, visit my Patreon linked right in the description and pledge as little as $1 a month to get early access to my videos and have your name join these fine people who are supporting my channel and helping it grow and improve. If you have any questions, please feel free to comment below, and I always appreciate likes, but YouTube is just as happy as if I get dislikes, so please be honest. Anyway, I thank you for watching this episode, and I hope to see you again on YouTube, or even sooner on Patreon. Bye-bye!